Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, my name is John Bellamerick, uh, and with me is Stephen Wong. Uh, we're both from Google, and uh, we're here to talk to you a little about Nephew, introduce it, and show you a sort of prototype demo. It's not like a demo of a real product yet or a real project yet, but it's, it's some prototype we've been working on. Um, so just to set the kind of context and stage a little bit, um, this is an image of various types of Google Cloud Pops. Um, this is obviously, uh, you know, a fair number of pops, but it's an orders of magnitude different than, say, RAN, which was much, much bigger, right? So we're, we're seeing um, in, you know, uh, this industry as a whole, the broader technology industry and cloud industry, uh, uh, sort of a um, desire to take some of the things we've learned in cloud and bring them to telco. That's probably one of the biggest reasons this whole conference exists. Um, and uh, one of the key insights in cloud and key differences between cloud computing and how we did it before uh, is the idea um, that the organizations, be it separate companies or organizations within a company, that build out the infrastructure, build out the actual compute resources, network resources, uh, storage resources, can be completely different and run on a different planning cycle than the those that consume it. And so the idea is that that consumption then can be much more agile. You can build out a platform like we've done, uh, various cloud providers have done, they built out massive regions with tons of capacity and people can consume it as they need it and they don't need to roll, they don't need to spend all that capital. Um, so over the last several years, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you know that this is an approach that uh, has been taken to try to do the same thing in the edge uh, environment. So that means that uh, as a, 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 a large organization with many pops out there, you may purchase equipment from a cloud provider, drop it in your pop, and it'll go back and talk to the cloud, and you're supposed to be able to manage and consume those resources from the cloud. Um, or you could build out your own platform to do that. So this is super, uh, uh, this creates enormous opportunities because now the innovation you can do based on that capacity that's out there without having to spend a year building out capacity for one idea, you can try many different ideas because the capacity is already there. Um, however, uh, what it doesn't address or think about is the massive problems that this causes for managing all of that software and that interconnected software out there on the, uh, on the network. So Stephen and I are here to talk about Nephew, um, which is a project that's targeted squarely at helping to solve that problem. So as John said, uh, we launched the project Nephew back in April of this year. Uh, we are very ha happy to get a lot of industry support out of this, and this is aimed to basically solve the problem, well, to, to address the problem of uh, deploying massive uh, uh, network functions across different edge and core uh, infrastructure resources. So this is a diagram of a very simple way of deploying a 5G network. Uh, so in 5G networks, you have many different components. You have components that would go into the edge cloud, you would, the edge sites, you have aggregation sites, uh, and then you have RANs that goes into like really remote edge. Uh, and the idea would be, do we have any, uh, do we have any way to understand where to put things? Uh, if you do it on scale, uh, how would you kind of get trade off between the cost of where to place something? Um, and then how to fully automate that the entire process out of this? And let's run a simple example, right? If you want to build a 5G core, I can turn back and start do this at the same time. Um, 5G core uh, for a fleet that is actually very light in, uh, in traffic, but then how would you, if you express just that intent, how would that get resolved into an actual deployment? Uh, and we don't, Nephew doesn't do day zero per se, so you, you, you still have to rack mount and push your thing into, into a data center. We don't do any of those. For day one, once the compute resources are in place, uh, you are, how do you know um, where you put your UPF? How, how, how do you know, uh, once you put your UPF uh, on your server, what are the IPs, what are the VLANs that are gonna go into? Uh, how do we know if a node has the specialized things that need to be done for UPF to be deployed? Versus, let's say AMF actually has less requirements. Um, and 
and then uh, configurable workloads, uh, how do we derive that Kubernetes manifest out of the infrastructures that you're going to target? And uh, how do we actually get them to talk to each other? And now when we jump to day two, uh, if you are adding a UPF, if you are uh, changing the load of any of the deployed network functions, uh, and then how do you resolve that dependencies between each other? How do you actually increase uh, infrastructure capacity to satisfy that intent? Um, how do you resize things on the topology front and then making sure that it's still functional? Um, all of this, and then how do you actually do progressive lower level, which, you, which is a requirement for network functions or any kind of telco workloads? And all of these are really, really hard, hard problems and very, very complex. Uh, but what gets really worse is the fact that they are not obviously from the same vendor, not from the same provider, not even the same layer, uh, and coming from even in the same telco team, uh, so from different teams, it's not from the same. Uh, so infrastructure has infrastructure management, uh, your server has server admins, Kubernetes have the Kubernetes admins, uh, your network functions have network functions, uh, deployment engineers, uh, and then there are people who are monitoring and things on the side. Um, so how do we reconcile between all these different teams having to unify on the same purpose of deploying things based on one single intent? So what do we do? We reduce complexity. Uh, we are using a single platform to do automations. Uh, we make it declarative instead of imperative. So we are actively, the software would be actively reconciling for the intent instead of having uh, a, a request response API and then, and then trying to see if that thing actually get deviated in the future. Uh, now you declare it if everything is continuously trying to reconcile. Uh, and the configurations, they are, they're, they're, they're now in a, in a format such that it will be singularly, co collaboratively, cooperatively managed by a single thing, single machines and human. So one major part, of course, is we are doing in Kubernetes by extending Kubernetes to understand, so Kubernetes is already managing your workloads, um, and obviously your network function workload needs to be deployed in Kubernetes, uh, but then now you are trying to make sure that Kubernetes understands uh, if you want to do a UPF deployment, if you want to deploy SMF, you deploy 5G core, um, what needs to be done? Uh, and and not, not necessarily a single, just not, not necessarily a single entity understanding everything. But now Kubernetes, which promotes a system where everything is fully distributed and loosely coupled, allows us to drop in things to insert into the system such that they would be, monitor they would be clearing uh, uh, problems and, 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 and moving the deployment forward that way. Uh, and then obviously, and everyone probably here notes, one way to extend Kubernetes is using CLDs and operators. Uh, and then now, and then part of NFIO is in fact to introduce uh, network functions um, constructs into Kubernetes. And that's only one part of the problems. The magic beyond actually extending Kubernetes is going to config as data. And here's Guy. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi. So, um, right, thank you, Stephen. So, so, uh, so sort of summarizing what Stephen said, right, the idea is that um, we, we saw this problem and our customers brought us this problem that said, uh, we've got all of these workloads to manage across these fleets. They're interconnected, it's complex. They're all managed by different systems. And so uh, our approach with Nafio was to say, hey, let's first reduce the complexity. Let's manage with a uniform system. Let's use declarative approaches. And so Kubernetes is that approach. Kubernetes is the way to avoid using all of those different systems. Now, you still often have those systems underlying there. We're not gonna replace everything that's out there. Those do the actuation, but we can create a layer on top of that that's managed by Kubernetes with a declarative uh, intent with active reconciliation, meaning it's continuously evaluating the state. Does the state look like what's intended? If not, it uses those existing actuation mechanisms, whatever they are, whether that's NetConf or whatever it may be, to actually actuate it. But of course, the one thing you do need out of those lower level elements, you need to be able to discover the state. So um, hopefully we're at a place where that's generally possible, but actually it's probably hard in a lot of cases. Uh, but anyway, so that's sort of summarizing what he said. The, 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 is that last piece of it is that you need to kind of um, represent all that configuration in a machine 
manipulable way, in a way that a machine can understand it and change it. And also, you want a way that independent parts of your organization that own different parts of that configuration can create their own automations sort of in their own world without having to know everywhere it's going to be used and tie it in. So the example that we'll see in a few minutes in the, um, in the demo is you can imagine uh, a scenario where you're deploying uh, a UPF and one of the things you need in order to deploy a UPF is you need to figure out what IP addresses all these different interfaces have. And the, the part of your organization that does network planning and IP planning um, isn't the same part of the organization that's deploying the UPF. So what's the integration point for these? And how do we create a system such that those integration points, uh, there's a sort of expandable, um, uh, we don't even know what all those integration points are up front. So we need to build a platform that allows us to um, instantiate these integration points and sort of collaborate. So instead of a giant monolithic uh, orchestration system that understands everything, you have um, a system that's an open, prov provides an open platform where different parts of the organization can inject their automation. So that's super ab abstract, um, so we'll get it a little more concrete when we see the demo. Um, to, to sort of uh, talk a little bit about what, how we're actually working to implement this, um, the sort of very high level Napio architecture, which uh, gets into, into some of the things I just said, is at the um, sort of very top north side, you've got your users and they've got a CLI and a, and a web UI. Um, there's a, a set of repositories. So it's a GitOps-based model. So what we're doing is putting a, an API on top of Git repositories. So each cluster that's out there in that broad set of Kubernetes cluster, that giant fleet, would have a, uh, a Git repo associated with it that contains the contents of its workloads. And then we build an API on top of it such that um, we can coordinate which packages, or bundles of Kubernetes resources, get delivered to which of those Git repositories, and therefore which of those clusters, and we can adjust the contents of those beforehand in storage, before we actually send them to, to Kubernetes. Um, so at a high level, what you have is a set of controllers. These are these that your independent parts of your organization might build. Um, and a set of packages with an API that allows those controllers to interact with those packages and reconfigure them. Um, all right, so uh, this is a little complicated diagram. Uh, actually, I might go over here and point to it. Um, So on the left, these are two totally different diagrams, really. On the left, it's sort of a more detailed version of what I, what I just showed. So you have a management cluster. A management cluster is where different parts of the Napier cluster live. Um, we have different repositories. We have uh, sort of up, what I would call upstream repositories. These could be the network function vendors could publish their configuration packages, uh, like package software vendors, in these upstream repositories. And then you have sort of private catalog ones. So in your organization, you can pull down that private, uh, that, that package piece of software from the vendor, and you can customize it, add policies associated with your organization, maybe add some information about the integration points to your particular organization. And then you publish that to your, your catalog. Uh, your deployers come along and pull things out of that and then decide to deploy it across the various clusters. Um, these are the edge clusters along the bottom. We see Git repositories, one for each one, and there's a Git syncer called Config Sync. It's sort of like Argo CD, which is also something you can use in, in this place. But basically, it takes something from Git, puts it into the Kubernetes API server. In here, there's a bunch of controllers, and what do those controllers do? They take Kubernetes resources, and they take inputs from different places, and they assemble them into a, a final configuration. So this is now showing a little bit of that flow. It's sort of going to drill into this so as a, as a human user, this is what we're going to demo right now. As a human user, you create uh, something we call a 5, 5G core topology resource, uh, which contains basic information about your UPF as it, sort of the non-cluster specific information. So specific information that 
that, that isn't about a particular cluster. Similarly, within already within the cluster, we have uh, with the management cluster, we have information, demographic information about all of those edge clusters. So this edge cluster is in the it's Seattle. This edge cluster is in San Jose, um, whatever it may be, and that may affect, for example, that IP address. Um, the 5G topology controller will take that resource and will will uh, use it to create another resource, which represents sort of the the um, how to fan out that particular configuration of the UPF across many clusters. That controller actually creates individual variants of the package and, um, and in a draft format. And then an IPAM controller comes in and injects IP addresses uh, that it allocates out of an IPAM system. And those finally get delivered down to the cluster. So uh, I can demonstrate that now. So I know this is pretty rushed. So tomorrow, we have a whole day of Nephew, and a lot more of this will become clear. This is pretty, um, um, OK. So now I have to do this uh, sideways. All right. So, all right. so what, what we have here um, is uh, the sort of prototype UI. And um, building up some of those components, um, well, I, you know what, I just won't bother with that. Uh, we'll start with this. So, um, ah, of course, demo gods. Um, <laughs> ah, my tunnel maybe died. This worked right beforehand. Yep, my tunnel died here. Sorry about this, folks. Uh, yeah, we went port forwarding into a VM, and so it. Um. All right, let's try this. There we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do is create this 5G topology resource that looks like this. So, basically, this is saying um, I want to create a free 5GC UPF. Um, I want it to be distributed to my edge clusters. In my sort of layout, I have uh, two what I call edge clusters and two one regional cluster in addition to the management cluster. And I want, I want each of those instances to have this level of capacity. And then these are the networks I should attach to. You notice there's no IP addresses here. It's just sort of network names. Um, and uh, so let's do that. I can bring my terminal over here, too, so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, sorry if that's tiny. Um, So I'm applying that topology resource. We don't have a UI screen to create the topology resource. So what's going to happen now is that's going to generate uh, what we call a, a package deployment. That's this. And um, that contains uh, two instances of the UPF package, one for each edge cluster. And if we drill into that, what we can see is that, that what's happened so far is in that package, remember I talked about different automations plugging into the package. So the package initially gets created kind of with stubs for where those things should be plugged in. The first thing that gets plugged in actually at fan out time is sort of just general information about the cluster. Where is it located and some other, some other details. Um, we can, in fact, we can see what that looks like. Um, okay, so um, by looking at uh, this cluster context, so you can see that what happened is this got injected in um, and the site code changed from example to edge one. And then there's some other information about this particular edge cluster uses a uh, Mac VLAN CNI and this is the master interface used for that. So um, then there's another piece here that hasn't yet been injected. So this is a separate controller that runs 
independently, but this is our integration point. It's a, it's a, a little condition within the, the package that tells us uh, this information is, is needed. So let's refresh and it, hopefully it will have gotten there by now. Yes, so since while we were talking, this resource got injected, so the, the, the 5G topology controller took that UPF information, injected it in here, and said, okay, these are the details that, combining with the site code and other things, this is the details you need. And uh, here are the actual IPAM allocation requests that are needed based upon the way you've configured that UPF in that particular instance. So in a moment, another controller will come in, and all it understands is this IPAM allocation resource which looks something like this. So you can see it's saying, give me a, a this one's saying, give me a pool with prefix length 16 and take it from this layer three address space effectively. Um, so th the point here is that that IPAM controller is built completely independently, configured completely independently um, from the people building all of the, the actual network functions and their deployments. So we've created a way for those things to coordinate. And let's see if I refresh. We can see conditions have all cleared. The IP allocation was injected. And we can go back and look at what that looks like. This is the one we were just looking at. And now we see there's an IP pool, a slash 16 that's been allocated for this particular thing. So once this all looks good, we can have automation that actually goes and does this, or we can, as a human, we've reviewed it. We can say propose, uh, and a, oh, I wonder if I, oh, no, something went wrong. Demo, demo code, remember. All right. Uh, all right, and then I can approve it. And once I do that, I don't know, something is going wrong. But um, tomorrow. tomorrow that'll work. <laughs> um, but the idea is that, and I'll, we'll leave a few moments for questions, I think. We have eight minutes left. So, so in any case, that's kind of a very quick overview um, of, of how we can build out a platform such that you know, uh, we can create configurations for workloads and we can build in intelligence in those controllers. What we're, we're seeing sort of the very early bits, but what you can actually do is build in like uh, dependency management here. So that for example, you say I wanna deploy uh, these UPFs across this, this region, and we have another controller that can say, oh, in order to do that, you need more, you need actually new Kubernetes clusters. We've got the hardware out there, but it's not configured for Kubernetes, and we can actually instantiate new Kubernetes uh, Kubernetes clusters using um, some of the downstream projects like uh, Crossplane or something like that um, if we add edge capabilities uh, provisioning e via edge APIs on the cloud provider. So, like, you know, by putting the configuration into a machine readable and understandable format, that is Kubernetes resources, um, we're able to build automations that can reason about them and, and, and by separating those APIs properly we're able to allow different parts of the organization or different companies even to build those automations in isolation uh, and then integrate them all together. So, uh, any questions? Here, I'm gonna give you this because the virtual people, if there are any, won't hear you otherwise. Why limit it to the, to the network function? I see this, this could be done for any target. It could be hard yeah, to work out. Yeah. Did, 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 you, did somebody pay you? Like, yeah. Um, so, so, so actually, I'm not from the telco organization at Google. I'm from the Anthos Configuration Management Organization, and th which a lot of these are built on top of our platform and pieces of our open source code. Um, to me, this is, the problem is fleet, is management of, of complex workloads across large fleets. Um, telco is, 
the, the, what I've, talking to our customers, very, very few of our customers have that problem yet, right? There are some, but telco hits these problems earlier than everybody else because the scale is so massive, the workloads are so complex, and they're not just complex, like most of the other, you mean, other customers would have similar problems because they do have things like special sensors. There's a reason things are out of the edge, right? Usually it's because there's a special, special processing of data you don't want to move all the way to the cloud, it's too slow. Um, so they, they're not just generic hardware out there, but, but still, Telco has m many special requirements on the node, so there's just added complexity. So this is sort of the first place where, where in my mind, and, and Stephen is from the Telco organization, he may, he may differ, my mind, uh, the goal is building out a more general purpose platform, but this is our first use case. mentioned about the configuration part of the thing, right? As some abstraction, you showed the data model and so forth. In order to really interact with the, the UPFs, right, uh, do any type of uh, flow programming and so forth, have you guys really, you know, talked about any of the abstractions that is like, you know, people or anything like that? So, so this is, well, uh, you may, I'll say this. So in, in the broader Nephew community, we have, I only showed you, we have what we call three swim lanes. Um, and I've only showed you swim lane two, the middle swim lane, which is about generating Kubernetes manifests and work. We, yeah, actually, yeah. you're a good point. We do. Um, the first swim lane is. Um, oh, it can't be in presentation mode because it's it's a hidden slide. But we'll share the PDF afterward. But um, the the first swim lane is infrastructure. That's what I was mentioning briefly about provisioning clusters, provisioning cloud infrastructure. The second swim lane is provisioning the workloads across those clusters. The third one is provisioning the actual contents of those workloads. And that's a really hard problem. <laughs> um, so we haven't bitten it off yet. Um, we're barely biting off what we've got, barely chewing what we've bitten off already. But, but um, that's definitely in, in, and actually that's one of the main reasons we started Nephew as opposed to Google just going ahead and doing it. We're like, we can't do that alone. We need everybody participating in that. And so that's, that's absolutely 100% a goal of just a ways off. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah, I mean, we, we start, we, yeah, we, we launched it in April and then June we had a first face-to-face -face and we're still kind of in formation of requirements, like there's still so much, all of these APIs I showed you, they're all just example, yeah, v, v, v0.01, exactly. They're like, this is, this is and frankly, it's Steve, so, so Stephen and Tal who's here and, and we have a bunch of folks, we, we're in the SIG automation and, and SIG automation owns like sort of the implementation of these things, but the logical model of what those, those APIs look like is a different, different SIG um, that Sana, I see in the back, is yeah, yeah, she's uh, chair of that SIG. So those are things we're hoping tomorrow to talk more about with that SIG about like how do we uh, get the next step of those models. Yes, absolutely. In the way that has said the, uh, the vendors on this case, me for instance for Nokia, we have identified uh, some of the issues regarding uh, the scale, uh, scale up, scale down, scale out, scale, up, which in most of the situations related to the edge is really, really complex. We 
good as said. Uh, the reason for the edge deployment is about processing as close as possible to the endpoint. And when I say endpoint, it doesn't mean uh, from now on only the mobile phone. So this is our uh, network is so important, and that's the reason why I don't care. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't mean to think, like, this, this has been a huge community effort. In fact, all that demo was run on a set of VMs that a bunch of folks from the community built out. Yeah, Automations tomorrow, the workshop, it's going to be awesome. So uh, I see Vish and I see Victor and all these folks who, them yeah, <laughs> who contributed. Yes. Good. It's on. Okay. Good. Hi, I'm, I'm from Verizon, um, and also the co-chair of and uh, we know that Anakin should definitely, um, we should definitely be talking to you guys because uh, we, we're doing the funding the infrastructure to support um, CNFs okay. for the telco world. Um, and also speaking from my experience um, deploying a bunch of tools, um, it's really complex. Yeah. And the tools at the end, I should point out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. Because um, we wrote most of our tools ourselves because we didn't know it at the time, and this was goes back three, four years, um, had any tools. Right. So, so, so we hope to stand on the shoulders of everybody who's built those tools because, like, part of the goal of Nephio is to consume and make the platform open enough that we can consume different upstream projects that, that have done a lot of the work, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's, it hinges on that first pillar. So I, I think Nephew is having two pillars. One is Kubernetes everywhere, and the other is config as data. The config as data, you can't really do without the Kubernetes everywhere, and nobody's done that yet. Like, there's many point solutions, right? There's point solutions at various places in the stack that use Kubernetes, but it's like, it's very disconnected. And so there's a huge effort to try to integrate all those things. I think we're out of time, actually. So, all right, thank you all, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Right.